Hi, it's Lucy, and today I am going to be reading the Wayward Children series in hopefully 48 hours. Why am I doing this? Because I feel like it. I don't know. The whole series has been on my TBR. I've already a little bit clickbaited you because I've already read the first two books in this series, so I won't be rereading them for this video because I don't want to. I will be reading the rest. There are five other books in this series for me to read, and I'll tell you how I felt about the first two. I do remember how I felt them. I read them both on Booktube. So if you really want my like closest to the end of moment reviews of the first two, then you can check out those wrap ups if you want to, they'll be linked down below. But before we get started, let's talk about the Wayward Children series. The first book in the series is Every Heart a Doorway. This, this is not Shauna McGuire's biggest series. She's written a lot more series before this. And prior to this, she was known more for her adult, like I think paranormal fantasy is what she usually writes, which this series kind of is like paranormal fantasy, but this definitely put her on the map with booktube. Lots of people in this corner of the internet love this series in particular and also enjoy Jean and Aguirre because of this series. I just wanna feel like I wanna get in the hype. Like I said, I've already read the first two and I did enjoy them, just not as much as everyone else seems to, but I wanna see if reading the rest of them can like get me like fully on the hype train. And even if it doesn't, at least I'll have read them. There will be timestamps down below for each book if you wanna skip around and also links to buy the books if you're so inclined and wanna support my channel. Without further ado, let's talk about the first two books. So this series follows these teenagers who have all come from portal worlds, basically when they were younger. At some point they fell through a portal, they crawled into a portal, they somehow ended up in another world that ended up being sort of perfect for them. It fit like their personality, what they were looking for in life. Think of the world sort of like Narnia, that's the kind of fantasy it is. They end up in a completely separate world through these portals and they enjoy their time in their world, but for some reason they end up back in the real world. And because of this, a lot of these kids have trouble adjusting to the real world. So oftentimes they end up getting sent away and most of them get sent away to Eleanor West School for Wayward Children, hence the title of the series, Wayward Children series. And their parents or whoever's sending them there think it's like kind of like a therapy school, which it kind of is, but not in the way that their parents are thinking because these kids always come back and talk about these amazing fantastical worlds or just like worlds that couldn't possibly exist. And so their parents think something's wrong with their kid. like these things don't exist. So they imagine something must have happened to them. They don't believe them. So they get sent to the school in order to correct that. But at the school, everyone knows that those worlds are real and all the other students are people who have really been to those worlds. The school is to help them cope with not being in their world. By the way, I will say that the titles of the series definitely really intrigue me. I really enjoy all of them. I feel like they're just good titles, you know? They have that intrigue, mystique, you know? Anyway, this one follows a girl named Nancy whose world she calls the land of the dead and she was sent back to the real world and her parents ended up sending her to the school where she meets all these other people who have been to different worlds. And there's also like a murder mystery B plot basically because kids at the school start ending up dead and they're trying to figure out who's doing it, why they're doing it. But it's mostly about Nancy coming to terms with not being in her world. We also learn a little bit about her world and I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the atmosphere of the book and it's what made me continue on in the stories because I feel like Sean McGuire is really good at building up atmosphere and setting. I appreciated that there was LGBTQ plus representation in this book. Nancy is asexual and that is explored within the story and it ties back into her world. And there's also a trans side character who I'm looking forward to seeing in future books. I thought the mystery was kind of where it lost me or not lost me, but I just didn't think it was done as well. I easily guessed who it was as soon as there was like a clue. I didn't guess why they were doing it, but yeah, I just didn't think it fit the story as well as it could have. And I wasn't a huge fan of that, but overall I really liked the first book. The second book is Down Among the Sticks and Bones. I didn't like this one as much as the first book, which is a very unpopular opinion. People love this book in this series in particular, I feel like I'm definitely an outlier. This follows two girls that we met in the first book. I believe the series is meant to alternate every other book basically is set at the school and the other books are set in the various fantasy worlds following one of them, either before or after they end up at the school, I think. Down Among the Sticks and Bones is set before these two girls end up at the school and it deals a lot with I felt like gender roles and uh, just expectations from your parents. I just didn't like this one as much. The atmosphere was so good. It really had a dark and creepy atmosphere, which I really liked. I just didn't like personally how the characters were dealt with, but I still gave it, I think three and a half stars. So it was definitely enjoyable and it's not stopping me from reading the series, even though I know that I think the fourth book 
follows these characters again, which I'm not a fan of. Also, I do want to say that this video will be as spoiler free as possible. I'm going to try and be as bare bones as possible when actually telling plot points. I'll still be trying to give as full reviews as possible, but just letting you know, if you haven't read the series, I think you'll be safe to watch this video and figure out if you want to read the series. The only thing that might be considered spoilers is that I will be saying character names and whether they appear in future slash previous books. So like I said in the beginning, my plan for this video is for me to read these books in 48 hours. They are a series of novellas, so I feel like I can do it. I will be starting this actually tomorrow. I'm just filming the intro now. I want to start off the video looking good. Also look at my plant. I'll update you all as I read, just take you along my weekend, I think, and Okay, so I don't think you can see me properly right now, sorry about that, but I just wanted to announce that I'm going to be starting my 48 hours. It's exactly 4 o'clock right now, so I'm going to start reading Beneath the Sugar Sky. There's two cats with me, it's a mess right now, and also my camera's about to die, so let's get into it. So I finished Beneath the Sugar Sky. I actually really enjoyed this. Not actually, I ex I did expect to enjoy it. Anyway, I enjoyed this more than the second book. I'm not sure where I'd rank it from the first book. I'm not sure if I enjoyed it more or oh, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. I'm not sure. I will be doing a ranking of all the books by the end of this video. Reading this book has made me realize that I did forget some things, but luckily I figured out that the Wikipedia page for this series is very well detailed. So I basically read the whole summary for the first book so I wouldn't have to reread it. And now I feel more prepared to go into the fourth book. But let me tell you my feelings about this third book. I was a little bit confused when I started this book because I had just read the Goodreads synopsis and the Goodreads synopsis mentions Sumi's daughter, which was very confusing for me. If, if you read the first book, you know why. And I was even more confused because I figured we'd be following her perspective, like the book would be told from her perspective, which is not true. It's told from a third character who is completely new, whose name is Cora. She comes to the school after the events of the first book. I did enjoy her characterization. I was really excited for Sumi's daughter though, which, so that was a little disappointing for me because I really liked Sumi from the first book, so I was excited to see more of her, which is not exactly what we got. We got to see her world though, which I really enjoyed. Our main character in this book is named Cora. She's a mermaid basically, and she comes from, I forgot what they called the world, but it's like she lived underwater basically and she had gills and everything. She swam underwater and that was her world and that was her perfect world. She has a whole thing about being a swimmer that's described a lot, which I actually really like. This main character is fat. I'm not fat and I've never struggled with being like really overweight. So take what I'm saying with a grain of salt, but this is just my opinion. I thought that part was well done, except for the fact that I felt like it, ha not harped on it too much because obviously when you're insecure about something, when you've dealt with something that you got bullied for that lots of people pay attention to, like it's obviously going to be mentioned a lot like you're obviously going to be thinking about it a lot and it is what she looks like so it comes up a lot but there were just some instances where it came up and there were comparisons and i was like why did we have to do that like we could have done other things like there was good things because this book talks about how at the school for wayward children how when cora got there she was expecting to be made fun of for being fat and how at her old school like that was the only thing people paid attention to really and, and when she was in her world being a mermaid basically how like having the extra weight like added for more insulation in the cold water and like she's also really athletic like i said she was a swimmer she was a swimmer before showing up in the mermaid world and then obviously being a mermaid she was a swimmer and she still talks about how she loves it and all the training that she does to like keep up her athletic ability with swimming and everything so she's ready to go back to her world basically and i thought that was all cool but then there were some instances where Basically, there's an instance where she runs into someone and she figure and she felt like, oh, like this person's gonna make fun of me because I'm fat because I ran into them. But then the person goes like, oh, I wouldn't do that. I know what it's like because I'm Mexican. And I just thought that was a weird dichotomy. It felt like a weird comparison that didn't need to be made. And I get what Shauna McGuire was trying to do, but it was weird. So like just little things like that. But I did like seeing her. I liked seeing what she brought to the story. There was also stuff with the world basically and how we learn more about like the, what do they call them? Like the tendencies of the world. I'm not, I don't remember what they call them exactly, but like some worlds have high logic and some worlds have like more nonsense. And we learn more about like that, like aspect to the world. We get to do like more traveling in this book. That's why I really enjoyed it. We get to see a couple of worlds that we didn't quite get to see in the first book. And I really like that we got to see more of Sumi's world, which if you remember, 
from the first book is like basically candy and I just thought that was fun and this whole thing was like a really fun adventure like with an ensemble not ensemble because Cora is the main perspective but like we get to see like four other people like all go on this basically quest. I just thought that was fun. I really liked it. I really liked the overall messaging. I liked the messaging of the whole series and it continues on in this of just like finding your place in the world would be really good for teens and me too, an adult. So yeah, I really enjoyed this whole thing. The writing was once again lush. The atmosphere I felt like was good. I listened to the audiobook and I enjoyed the audio narrator. The only thing I would caution against if you have like a problem with like high pitched voices in both a good and negative way. The narrator does different voices for different characters and there's just one character that ends up with like a really not weirdly high pitch it kind of makes sense for the character but it just I could see how that could be grating. So watch out for that. But other than that I enjoyed listening to the audiobook. Like I said I enjoyed seeing the other characters and even though we didn't get to see we saw basically three worlds. We saw Earth, the candy baking world, which is called Confection, and we got to see another world that I won't spoil. And we also got to see some like characters from the first book. A lot of the characters from the first book come back, and I think they'll be coming back through the end of the series, which I'm really enjoying. I kind of thought we wouldn't see any of them in the future. I'd expected this one to be in the past, which didn't make sense. I'm pretty sure the series alternates. So the first book was you know, the starting, so it was the present. And then the second book was a prequel, and then this book was in the present. So the next book is, I'm pretty sure, a prequel. Looking forward to seeing what happens at. I know we get to go to the Goblin Market, which is a high logic world, and definitely this whole series gives Sean and Noir like a lot of leeway with the magic systems because every world has its own. So I'm looking forward to just seeing more of what's going on, getting to know the next character who's gonna be Lundy. And I really don't remember her from the first book, but I, as I said, read the summary from the first book, so now I do. <laughs> in case you're wondering, it is also 10.30 p.m. I did wanna mention that in case you're wondering how the 48 hours is going, right now I'm behind technically. I didn't calculate pages or anything or how many books I need to read. Yeah, but I do have to get a move on with the second one. So I finished In an Absent Dream. Here's the cover. I now understand the cover. I didn't realize, I never really looked at what was on it, but after reading it, I understand it now. This one follows Lundy, who I think I said in the last clip we met in the first book. And so we know what happens to her by the end of this book, but somehow this still managed to keep me, not on the edge of, my seat, but like just wishing that things were different and hoping that Sean McGuire would change it. Uh, alas, that did not happen. This was, I feel like maybe the saddest, not the saddest book, cause maybe the second one is pretty sad also, but I definitely like this more than the second one. I think this might be my favorite in the series so far. I think I'm gonna give this four and a half stars. I just really liked it. I liked how it was a bit different from the first three in the sense that in the first three books it felt pretty clear cut how the main characters and the characters that we were following didn't fit into our world and like had to go to their new worlds and how those new worlds really fit them. This one it was not as clear cut how Lindy didn't fit and actually the book like goes out of its way to be like Lindy's normal and extraordinary. There's like a really nice line about kids in here which I wish I remembered right now to quote but like how every child is both ordinary and extraordinary. The book goes out of its way to like show how her family like loves her and in the first three all the main characters they had like a lot of issues with their families not understanding them or wanting them to be completely different than how they were and there was a lot of resentment and how their families basically treated them because of that. In this one Lundy's dad had gone to her world before when he was a kid so we got to see we didn't get to see him there really but he knew what had happened to Lundy when she came back. Lundy does go back and forth between our world and her world which I should say is the Goblin Market. That is the world we're exploring in this book. I thought it was a really interesting world. I'm definitely probably gonna like the more logical worlds better as the series goes on just because that's just the type of person I am. If I were going to a new world it would probably be a logical one. Basically the Goblin Market is a world where you get everything through a fair trade and the market always makes sure that it's fair. So Lundy's a girl who likes rules so this world seems to fit her but then this book also not quite explores but it does give mention to how some of these worlds are not quite what they seem and why the world is the way it is and how it may seem good on the outside but that doesn't mean it necessarily is good even if it seems that way so i thought that was also an interesting aspect i felt like this book brought in a lot like i said it had like a family aspect because her family loves her her family 
like does appreciate her even if it's not in the exact way that Lundy does but it it felt like a family it's not like they hated her or like really wanted her to drastically change before she went and before she went Lundy hadn't felt super out of place it seemed like before she found her door so that was like a different aspect and i just like seeing that explored the writing once again was very lush i should probably stop mentioning it because shawana mcguire is a good writer this has already been proven throughout the series and i feel like the quality is not gonna go down drastically and yeah i like Lundy as a character she's a more bookish character which i'm sure a lot of people watching this video will appreciate yeah i really enjoyed it once again it's very sad because of how it ends and also because there's just some moments in here because like i said this like has a family aspect we get to see her family and like actually show care for her and everything so that part was also very sad the only aspects i didn't like i'm struggling to think of them right now i know there were some or like a couple i do think the goblin market rules or just how the world is could have been a little clearer i have a lot of trouble with all of these portal fantasies understanding how other people live in them. Uh, my other issue, I guess, was that Lundy has a friendship in here that honestly feels very lopsided and one-sided and was just, I don't know, very odd to me. Like, Lundy gives a lo lot up for this friendship and I was just wondering, like, why it couldn't be made to seem more even. And also, this might bother some other people. It didn't bother me quite as much because I appreciated it as a character study and just, like, showing me the worlds and everything but there is like lundy goes on like a couple of like adventures she goes through like some kind of trauma that i won't detail here because it's a spoiler and it all happens in between like a chapter ends the next chapter is like oh this happened in between these two chapters it would have been nice to see those quests and everything and like that's where the action is so it just feels like these exciting moments get glossed over. I didn't mind it as much because like I said, I appreciate it as a character study, but I could see how that could bother people. But in the end, like I said, I think I'm giving this four and a half stars. I really, really did like it just for how different it was. And I'm looking forward to seeing the world in the next one. I actually don't know what it is. So let's find out. I need my glasses for this. Next I'll be reading Come Tumbling Down, which is number five. And then I'll be reading Across the Green Grass Field and then Where the Drowned Girls Go. That's three more books I have to read. Come Tumbling Down. It seems like it's a sequel to the second one, Jack and Jill's story. It says that Jack somehow comes back to the school. And if and based on the end of the first book, Jack and Jill weren't at the school anymore. And now it says Jack is back. So we'll see where that goes. I'm looking forward to reading it. Hopefully I'll like it a little bit more than the second one. I'm not sure anything will beat In an Absent Dream for me, but we'll find out. My least favorite in the series, I'm pretty sure. Thor's here to console me because it was my least favorite. I'm between giving this two and a half and three stars. The writing in the series is still good. I appreciated like the atmosphere once again. I have to say it with every book. The atmosphere was like well done and it matched the darkness of the story. It's just I didn't like the story in this one, so I don't know where to go from here. This is sequel to the second book down among the sticks and bones and we once again follow jack of jack and jill their world is called the moors and it's like this horror movie universe basically the two main monsters that they have is vampires and there's a scientist who is clearly reminiscent of victor frankenstein so yeah and jack was the apprentice to the scientist and jill was the vampire's daughter kind of and the events of the first book happened i guess as a sequel to the first book i should say like a direct sequel but it doesn't take place directly a anyway the events of the first book happened and then at the end of the first book jack and jill end up going back to the moors and then in this book jack shows up back at eleanor's home for wayward children and she has a quest for everyone to go on basically and i just wasn't a huge fan of it i wasn't happy to be back in the moors i really would have liked to go to a different world. Again, that's, I feel like the strong suit of the series, just like getting to see all these different worlds and we didn't get to see a new one in this one. The Moors was explored a little more 
deep or widely, I should say. We get to see a little more of it. We get to see corners. I also want to say, I should have brought this up like two books ago. The last title that I'm going to be reading, which is Where the Drowned Girls Go, has been foreshadowed. I feel like this whole time there's constant mentions of drowning. One of the characters in the third book, who I don't think I mentioned when I talked about that, is called a drowned girl. In this one, we see that the Moors has the drowned gods. And one of the characters, the one uh, Cora from the third book, is a mermaid, as I mentioned. And she gets drawn to the drowned gods, basically. And it's like a whole thing, which I won't go into for spoilers or whatever. But yes, there's a lot of mention of drowned gods, the water, drowning, drowned girls. And so I feel like I'm really intrigued to read the last book so far in the series, just because I want to know what is happening with this drowning situation. But anyway, back to the plot of the story. We're set on this quest to the moors to basically help Jack solve her issues with Jill. And I just, I don't like their sibling dynamic. I don't like how it's dealt with. I don't like how it's shown. I think there's something to be said for like having not quite a rivalry, between siblings, but just never feeling enough between siblings. And I don't think it's explored. I guess it's just not explored in a way that I would have wanted it to be explored. I don't like how certain aspects are villainized. To me, it felt like in the second book that feminine things were being demonized in this kind, I guess, more roundabout way. I can just kind of see where both sides are coming from. And I don't feel like the book acknowledges that. Like, obviously, Jill did some really bad things. Also, so did Jack. I just I just don't like how the book explores it. Like, that's what it comes down to. And so just having to read about this relationship that I don't like how the book is dealing with it, it was not that fun for me. I did like, like I said, the writing and I liked seeing more of the Moors, more of the Moors, the characters. We do get to see basically all the other characters we saw in the third book and in the first book. I would really, really like to explore their worlds eventually, hopefully. And that's kind of all I have to say about this book. It's my least favorite. I don't think we'll be seeing Jack and Jill again, and I'm glad for it. And yeah, the next book is Across the Green Grass Fields. I think that's what it's called. And the character is called Reagan, who I don't remember ever hearing from. So I don't think we've seen them before. Oh, also I forgot to mention that in Come Tumbling Down, Jack has OCD, and then her girlfriend is technically mute or partially mute, I guess, and uses sign language to communicate sometimes, which I liked having that representation. The partially mute thing, like her disability comes from like magicalness. So I don't really know how that representation comes across to people who might actually be mute and not actually be using sign language. So keep that in mind. I imagine it would be nice to see characters regularly using sign language. Yes, the next book is Across the Green Grass Fields. The character that we follow, I don't remember their name, so I don't know what's happening. I think this book is gonna be what I imagined the series was, because this series was a lot more interconnected than I thought it was going to be. I didn't expect the third book to have so, so many callbacks to the first book, and I didn't have, expect this book to have so many callbacks. Oh, by the way, it's 9.30 p.m. I forgot I'm doing this in 48 hours. I do think I'm gonna do it. I've got three books down, two to go. I'm probably gonna read, I'm either gonna read the entire six month tonight, or I'm gonna read like half of it and then half in the morning, and then I'll finish with the last one tomorrow. We'll see what happens. In honor of me finishing Across the Green Grass Fields, I was like, let me try and get this shot next to my Monstera plant. Um, it, this shot does not really look how I wanted it to, so please forgive me, but everybody say hi to my Monstera. I just got her. Across the Green Grass Fields technically doesn't really have a lot to do with plants at all, so it just it has green in the title and there is grass, so. In this book, we follow Reagan, who is a horse girl, like a stereotypical horse girl. Everybody knows about them, at least in where I'm from, whereabouts, my parts of the world, etc. You know, she really loves her horses. Uh, it's commented on in the beginning of the story how she might even love them more than her parents. And we start the story off when she's six years old. The world she ends up going to is horse world. Honestly, she ends up in a world where there are a lot of talking beasts. This one reminded me a lot of the horse and his boy. The storyline of this isn't similar at all, but it's just the horses and the atmosphere and the thing of the talking animals just reminded me of the horse and his boy. But yes, Reagan ends up in this talking beast world, I guess. She sees 
unicorns and she meets centaurs and kelpies and something called peritons. Basically in this world everyone believes that she's there to save them because apparently whenever a human shows up it means that the human is there to save them all. Yeah so that's the story we follow. This is another one where the main character's family life is actually good. She has family that loves her, her parents that love her and appreciate her and like I said she's only six or seven I think she's in first grade when the book first starts and by the time she gets to the world I believe she must be 10. The sort of catalyst for her finding her door is that she is not developing at the same rate as the other girls in her class and she ends up talking to her parents about that and so we find out that Reagan is actually intersex. I'm not intersex so once again take what I say with a grain of salt but it seemed like it was written in a decent and respectful way to me. The way her parents treat it is in definitely a respectful way and the catalyst for her finding the door is that she ends up telling kind of a mean girl at school and that turns into a whole thing and obviously Regan gets upset and then she finds her door. Like all the stories previously wherever the characters find the worlds she finds this new world where she feels like she fits in, where no one expects other things of her, where she she learns the true meaning of friendship, which I thought was lovely. I thought this was a lovely story. I was going to comment on the last book. Basically, I was worried about how depressing the series is getting, which honestly, based on the title of the next book, I think it's going back to really depressing. Not that this was super lighthearted, but you know, we're in a fairy tale land of centaurs and unicorns, and like they have their own inner workings and politics and stuff, which actually the book does not exactly comment on but show there is also uh is the word i'm looking for bigotry xenophobia is it racism there's centaurs and unicorns and kelpies and other things so are those races i don't know there's discrimination amongst them but the world itself is very light-hearted you know like like the title says across the greengrass field is just like full of like fields and forests of nice lush things and yeah I just really enjoyed this. Like I said in the last clip I don't remember Reagan at all from any of the other books so I, we might have seen her in the first book and I don't remember like in passing maybe. I am not sure but this one is definitely the most standalone out of all of the books except for the first one because even the fourth one in an absent dream is still like that could also stand alone but um it might even work better you might have more stakes if you read that as a standalone but it does have a character that we know of from the first book and in an absent dream does have a mention of eleanor's home for wayward children as well this one has no mention of that no mention of anything else it just kind of reads like a standalone i really enjoyed it i'd give it four stars and it was a nice lovely break <laughs> because I kind of felt like I needed one. Now we're on to the last book, Where the Drowned Girls Go. I'm looking forward to this. I haven't read the synopsis for this yet. Let's let's read it together. We are going to the White Thorn Institute. The first step is always admitting you need help and you've already taken that step by requesting a transfer into our company. There is another school for children who fall through doors and fall back out again. It isn't as friendly as Eleanor's home, West's home for wayward children and it isn't as safe. When Eleanor West decided to open her school, her sanctuary, her home for wayward children, she knew from the beginning that there would be children she couldn't save. When Cora decides she needs a different direction, a different fate, a different prophecy, Miss West reluctantly agrees to transfer her to the other school where things are run very differently by Whitethorn, the headmaster. She will soon discover that not all doors are welcoming. So it looks like this one's going to follow Cora again who was technically the protagonist for the third book. I didn't dislike Cora at all. I did really enjoy reading her perspective. I'm not sure I, I will love being back in her head just because I don't know I'm kind of getting tired of the series. <laughs> Sorry to tell everyone but I I did this to myself you know trying to read it in 48 hours. If I weren't doing this video I probably would take a longer break between this and the next book but we'll see how it goes. Maybe I'll change my mind. Maybe I'll super duper love it. We'll come back to that. I have three hours left between four o'clock today. <laughs> Where the Drowned Girls Go, I have just finished this. I kind of am leaning towards a 3.75, which isn't a real rating for me because I don't do like quarter stars. It's half stars or full stars. Quarters is too much, but I'm really feeling a 3.75. I'm not sure if I'll round down or round up. Things I like, once again the writing, this is still technically in our world, but this takes place at the other school. Basically, Cora sends herself there after the events of Come Tumbling Down. Something happens while they're in the moors and Cora wants to go to the other school to try and deal with it, basically. And so Eleanor West 
sends her there, and the school is very different. They're a much more strict school, and that school is all about kind of forgetting where you came from instead of Eleanor's like reveling in where you came from, the, the other world that you went to that you feel like could be your home. The school wants you to forget. We have an adventure here. This ends up being an ensemble cast as well. Uh, we have some other characters from previous books in addition to Korra show up. This is, I guess, a slight spoiler for the series, but I just talked about Across the Green Grass Fields and I was like, oh, we've never met Reagan. Reagan does show up in this book. In this one, we get to see more of the power of friendship and like meeting new people and stuff. And also this one deals with fat phobia similarly to how it was dealt with in the third one. Beneath the Sugar Sky. I'm really having a hard time remembering all these names. I know I said in the beginning of this video that the names are, or titles of the books are really like interesting and they are interesting, but they're so long. I can't remember any of them and then the order they're in anyway. But in Beneath the Sugar Sky, that also has Korra as the main character. So obviously we're getting her similar perspective and she's still fat. So she's still dealing with fat phobia in her life. The I guess issue I had in this one, in the third book, I could see how it could be come off as preachy, but you know, I under, not understand, but like I get it. Like sometimes things just come off preachy and it, the author had something that she wanted to say. So I appreciate how she said it in that book. But in this book, she said it in the exact same way. This one actually did feel like more preachy. And it's not even like she dealt with another aspect of fat phobia. She literally said the same exact thing like it just went over how Cora is fat like she doesn't actually eat too much it's a metabolism thing she's still athletic uh, even though she's fat her body weight doesn't stop her from being able to do the things she wants to do and we heard all of that in the first book or not the first the first book she was in so this one just felt repetitive and it was like a third of the book <laughs> like the first third of the book was just going over the, all this stuff we had already heard in the exact same way in the third one so that's why I'm like leaning towards a three and a half. Also the, I guess, villain in this book, I would have appreciated more knowledge of, I guess, or like more, just more exploration, I guess, because this one, it seems to kind of come out of left field and we never, I, it feels like we're never gonna find out the answer, but we might, I don't know. It seemed like in the last book, we were never gonna see Reagan again and she showed up in this one. So we'll see, I guess. And I guess another thing would be like the plot takes a while to get started. For a while, we're just spending time with Cora being sad, but then like there's a whole action packed plot in the last like 30% of the book. I would have felt it better it being more even or something, I'm not sure. But the actual plot I did enjoy. I enjoyed the new characters we did meet in this book. I liked seeing them. I liked hearing about the worlds that they came from. I would love to see them in the future. I don't know if that's ever gonna happen because Sean and McGuire keeps reusing characters. We'll talk about that when I talk about the series overall. <laughs> but yeah, so overall I did enjoy this, but it's, it's, it's not quite what I expected, I don't know. So now I'm gonna rank the series and then I'll tell you my overall thoughts on the whole series since I did in fact read them all in, it wasn't 48 hours, it was 48 and a half hours. Right now it's 4.42, I finished at like 4.30. I've been talking, filming for the last 10 minutes, even though this clip hopefully is not 10 minutes long, but 48 and a half hours is still pretty good in my opinion. Here is my definitive ranking of the Wayward Children series so far up to book seven. Uh, obviously this is the definitive ranking. Nobody else is allowed to rank these books. My ranking is the only one that matters. And if your ranking is different, it doesn't matter because mine is the only one that matters. Obviously that was a joke. In the comments down below, let me know your ranking, how you think of my ranking, or you could guess my ranking. Like right now, pause the video before I do it. Guess my ranking based on like what I've said so far in the video. I'm going from least favorite to favorite in the series. So on the bottom, would be Come Tumbling Down. I liked that the least. Yeah, I liked it the least in this series. It was not my favorite. I do not like Jack and Jill that much. I do not like their stories. I hope we don't see them again. To go along with that, number six would be Down Among the Sticks and Bones. Once again, I don't like Jack and Jill. <laughs> number five, Where the Drowned Girls Go. Just because I, I don't know, I think there are other better ones. I'm kind of tired of seeing some of the same characters. I think the next two are kind of inter changeable. Beneath the Sugar Sky I think is next. I enjoyed seeing the ensemble characters and that was like the first time that that really happened. I liked being able to go to confection. I liked seeing them go through other worlds and everything. It's just I like the other ones more at this point. Every Heart a Doorway I think would be next. I liked it as the introduction to the series. If I didn't think that book was good I wouldn't have kept going on in the series. I actually liked Nancy when I read that book. I just liked the introductions we got to see, like just showing the whole 
world within the world of the Wayward Children series. Number two would be Across the Green Grass Fields. I just really enjoyed reading that story. It felt like a good, nice story. It's basically exactly what I expected from the series going in. Just like a short story about someone who falls through a portal and then this is what happened. That was the basic like plot line and I thought it was done well. I once again liked the main character. I liked how she maneuvered the world, what her story ended up like. And then finally, my favorite book in the series was In an Absent Dream. I thought it just mixed everything that I did enjoy about the series with the dark, like gloomy atmosphere, but still somehow feeling a little bit more lighthearted uh, until the end. A main character that I really enjoyed being in the head of, even though I wasn't a huge fan of her world, I could see how it fit her and I felt like this was a world that was most explained, I guess, or not most explained, but yeah, I guess, I guess most explained. Yeah, I just really enjoyed that aspect, even though it ended on a sad note, but like still in a fitting way. That's my ranking of the series. And now my overall thoughts in the series, like I keep saying, I really enjoyed the series. I think Shauna McGuire is a great writer. I think this format fits her really well. She seems to have a boundless well of ideas in her head. So I imagine the series will be going on for quite a while. <laughs> and I will continue to read them. The things that I would like to see in future books is I would like to see more new characters for me. And what I expected from the series was to continue to meet new people. And we do continue to meet new people, but I feel like we're not taking advantage of them as I would like to see them be taken advantage of. Like there are so many characters that we've been introduced to that I would like to see more of. I would like them to have their own books, but in this series, Cora gets two books. <laughs> no offense, like, and I just don't really get why? Like I just would have preferred that another character would get their own book instead of we continue to follow the same person, which I know is different for a series, but to me that's how the series is marketed. Like you're constantly following these different characters. So that's what I would want to see from the series. Something else that I really liked, but I would also like to see done better is that although there's a lot of diversity within the side characters and like the main, all the main characters are in some way like outside of the norm, whether that's like disability or sexuality, all the main characters as far as I can tell have been white. Sumi is not technically a main character that I could see. Like she's had perspective, but it's not really her book. And we also have Christopher who's Mexican American and like his world has to do with like the day of the dead basically he comes from a world of skeletons but once again he's not a main character so I probably understand why Shauna McGuire hasn't done a character who who's not white just because she's white but I think she should just at least give it a try <laughs> if you're going to make diversity such an important like pillar of your series but but overall I do enjoy where this books are going what the books do I think they all have like nice little lessons. These are YA books and I think they all have nice little lessons for teenagers reading these books. It seems to me that teenagers would enjoy them while grasping like any bigger elements of the stories. So yeah, I will continue reading them as a recommendation to any of you. My recommendation is basically in the order of my ranking, but also I do not recommend reading these <laughs> in quick succession like I did. For me, I just got tired and since this is a series where it's technically sequential, but not exactly, you don't really need to like have read them right away. Like if you have like a good enough memory where you remember, oh, like I met a character, then I think you'll be fine um, to not read them like immediately after each other. And I think you'll be better off <laughs> not doing that unless you really, really love the series, in which case do whatever you want. I mean, you do whatever you want regardless of what I say because I'm not your mom and I'm not the boss of you. That's the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching in the comments down below. Let me know if you've read any of the books in this series, if you're going to now that you've watched this video. Also leave me a door emoji. I'm sure that exists. That must exist, right? Oh, or a window, you know, your door could be a window. Or if you don't have emojis, you can type the words be sure because every door that the characters come across that leads them to another world or leads them back to our world says be sure because they want you to be sure that you belong in the world you're going to, or you want to be in that world. Um, so yeah, any of those, uh, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Sometimes I do these videos where I read books in 48 hours for some reason. I don't know if I'm gonna do this. Anyway, subscribe, hit the notification bell. I will see you in my next video. Thank you so much for watching, bye. I appreciate you stopping by.